Welcome to In The Pocket, your go-to source for all things social media marketing and branding. Stay ahead of the game and learn the latest strategies to boost your online presence and connect with your audience. So join us and start growing your brand today. And welcome everybody to this episode of In The Pocket with your host, Stacey King. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. First, I want to review a quick um, couple of items to make things go smoothly. Everyone is muted during this presentation. However, if you have a question, you can place those in the Q&A and we'll make sure that they get addressed throughout the training. If you have any comments during the presentation, feel free to place those in the chat and I'll be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat window for James. This training is brought to you by Social Jazz. Socialjazz.com orchestrates relationships, not music. They're a unique social media management tool for keeping your business present and front of mind in your community. My very special guest today is James Jenkins of Riskwell Insurance and the Agency Freedom Podcast. James has produced almost 100 episodes of his podcast with over 1,000 subscribers with 93 videos on his Riskwell YouTube channel as well. James is a continual learner and constantly changing things up and implementing new ideas and tactics to engage with his growing audience. I'm excited to learn from James today. Welcome, James. There you go. Thank you, Stacey. I appreciate the invitation to come chat here. And uh, we may do more conversational and, and more uh, you know, keynote style for this. Uh, do you have anything intro wise? Do you want to preface this with any of your questions or sort of just jump into the agenda that you and I set? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm good. I just, I want to hear how you made the decision, all that, just everything, all that okay. goes into having a successful podcast, of course. Well, the, the front end story is pretty interesting, I think. And I have to give credit to Jason Cass. Uh, a lot of folks in the insurance industry know him. If you're outside of insurance, you probably don't. Um, he reached out to me, um, gosh, it was February or March of 2021. Uh, we were still in in the uh, the pandemic experience at that point. Uh, not nearly as bad as it was uh, late in 20, uh, but we're still all kind of trying to figure out, okay, what's, what is the end of this? When do we get back to normal? How is this? And uh, I had been the guest on several other podcasts uh, in the insurance industry, and the download numbers uh, for my episodes on those other pods were uh, well above average. Uh, and Cass reached out and said, hey, I think you should have a podcast and, and talk to your peers in the industry and and you know speak your voice. And I flatly declined and said, I have absolutely no interest in doing a podcast. Um, I, I'm super busy running my business. Uh, at that point, we were in just a parabolic growth curve uh, in our insurance agency and risk management consulting and didn't have any time for it. And my team would have slit my throat at that point had I started off with something, um, you know, haphazardly. I, I flatly declined and Cass came back about three days later. It was it was a Friday when we talked and he came back Monday or Tuesday and was like, Jenkins, you need to freaking start a podcast. I was like, what in the like what am i going to do i'm not going to be just an other talking head because there's nothing more annoying to me than someone who does an ego stroke uh, of, of content where you can tell that the only reason they're doing something is because they love the sound of their own voice and their ego demands that they do something so they can you know put content out and then you watch something of theirs and the view count is very low and they're not saying anything of substance they're regurgitating what other people have said. And it's really hard to, to watch stuff like that. And I didn't want to be that because I don't want anyone thinking that way of me because, um, you know, Bradley Flowers and Scott Howell and others in the insurance industry. And obviously every industry has their, you know, content creators that are, are well-known and liked and respected. Um, it, my industry happens to be risk and insurance. So for anyone watching this from outside of that, just think of a well-respected and well-liked content creator or podcaster in your industry. That's the equivalent of what I see as the standard. It's like, I'm not going to be a podcaster if I can't have the same level of quality as these people that are already in existence in my industry and are doing it at a high level their product is really good. Their content is useful. It's actionable. It's relevant for me as a member of their 
industry. And if I'm going to start a podcast, well, by George, I got to figure out some angle to have my own voice because I'm not just going to be regurgitating what someone else is saying because I don't see any value in that. So, you know, as we're having this conversation of how do you get a podcast off the ground, one of the things that I would definitely encourage you to do is ask yourself the really hard question. Does this podcast need to exist? Is there a space for the voice that you want to put out, for the content that you want to put out? Does it need to exist? And if the answer is, I don't know, or maybe, well, then don't start a podcast. But if you if you can think of something that is not already being said in exactly the same way, if you can think of a new flavor to add to the conversation, if you can add some interesting nuance to the narrative, either in your city or geography, because um, we'll, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, there's different styles of podcast. You can have one that's industry specific. You can have one that's hyper local, that's only really relevant to people in a certain geographic area. Or you can have one that's just generalized entertainment value, like a, a Joe Rogan style of podcast. There's basically three main categories. So that's a different facet of the conversation. But before we even get to that, you have to answer the question, does this podcast need to exist? And what you're thinking of creating, does it already exist in substantially similar form? And if it does, then maybe skip the podcast and go to something else with your time. But if it doesn't, then, well, come on then. Let's go. Let's do this thing. So that's where the, the pod started because Jason came to me and basically demanded that I do a podcast. And I said, what is it going to be about? I'm not going to be just another voice. And he said, I don't know. You figure it out. I was like, what isn't being said? What, what story isn't being told? What kind of advice isn't being delivered? And I came from the captive insurance world. Uh, the farmers in all state and state farms of the world, exclusive agents that only represent one company. And in 2019, we launched Risk Well, uh, which is an independent insurance brokerage that represents just about anybody we want or need to for our clients. And those two, for someone who's outside the insurance industry, that seems like a really nuanced and semantic difference. It's incredibly different and it impacts the entire business, every level of the business, in every possible way, sales and marketing, hiring, training, onboarding, logistics, admin, clerical, HR, you know, financial, literally every aspect of a business is transformatively different if you're not a franchisee of some very large corporation. So the transition from going independent, leaving captivity as the title of my book to drop a little nugget, uh, leaving captivity is the title of the book because that's what I did. I left captivity. And the podcast is titled Agency Freedom because it's helping people leave their flavor of captivity and find their version, their flavor of freedom. Not my flavor, flavor of freedom, but theirs. Because every single person, every agency principal, every business owner, every entrepreneur is going to have their own unique flavor. And one of the things I feel like I have to say is do not copy someone else's flavor. Be free to do whatever you want with your podcast. What does your audience need? What does your audience want? You got to be thinking about your audience, what they need and want, of course, because if it's just an ego stroke and you're going to get on a podcast and, and talk about whatever you think, well, that may not be interesting for your audience unless you're Joe Rogan. But let's be honest, there's really only one Joe Rogan. Um, the, the reason for the podcast Ask yourself, why does this pod exist? And then from there, what is the goal? What are you trying to accomplish by creating a podcast? What goal are you looking for? How are you going to measure it? How are you going to know whether your podcast is working or not? Is it having the desired effect? Are you doing it for business reasons? Are you trying to use it to leverage sales and marketing opportunities to add revenue to an adjacent business of some kind? Are you trying to promote a local community? Are you trying to partner with other business owners and drive awareness of a cause that's important to you? Figure out what the goal is. Figure out what KPIs, key performance indicators you can put in place that will help inform you of whether or not this thing is having its desired effect. Because at a certain point, if this isn't working, well, then you should probably stop doing it and go do something else with your time. 
because your time is your most valuable, most precious resource. You only have 168 hours this week. What you do with your time matters tremendously, far more than what you do with your money. You can always get more money. You can't get more time. Very good advice. I love all of it. I uh, I really love the um, the the name of your book. That's great. Yeah. No, I uh, originally I had handcuffs on the cover. That was part of the design. And my wife was like, I don't like that at all. That's that's too edgy. Leaving captivity. Yeah. It sounds like a prison biography. And I'm like, okay, you're you're good point. Let's find a different way. So the and I'll just put it up here. Um, this is this is the cover of the book. So awesome. Yeah, it's no it's, shameless plugs here. It's good. We're good. We're all good. Um, nope. I like what you said about finding your voice, and I think that um, I say this all the time with clients. They ask, you know, what do I need to share with my audience? What do I need to tell my audience? And at the end of the day, um, your clients and your your prospects are telling you what they want to see. They're telling you and their engagement on other, um, you know, uh, other resources out there. You can you can see what they're clicking on on their social. You can kind of, you know, if you have a perfect client and that's the kind of client you want to resonate with, then go and see what he's engaging with. Go and see what, you know, your competitors are doing. Go and see. And I don't say copy your, your competitors, but I do think it's very important that you kind of have a, a finger of the on the pulse of what everyone else is doing so that you can elevate that or change it up. Yep. Also, there's gold in the inbox, right? Everywhere that if your clients are constantly asking you questions, you do it beautifully on your YouTube channel. I love how you answer questions that it seems that you're getting from your customers and it's things that they need to know. And then you can do little cool things with your email signature like you did and put a video in there to say, hey, this is a, you know, a, a most asked kind of question on cybersecurity. Let's put it in my email signature. And now everyone that gets that has the opportunity to see that video. It's really brilliant. Well, you're very kind. I, I appreciate that. It's a lot of trial and error has gone into this. Um, there, you know, like Thomas Edison said, you know, I, I'm not a genius. I didn't fail a thousand times. I just found a thousand ways that didn't work. So it, and, thinking uh, about it as 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 tinkering, like we're all inventors. Um, I, I'm not an insurance agency owner. I'm a marketer that happens to own an insurance agency. Because at, at the end of the day, and this this is just soapboxing for a second, so many people are concerned about sales. So many people are concerned about where's the revenue going to come from? Where is the next deal going to come from? James, I have an empty pipeline. I've got to go out there and make sales happen. No, you don't. you got to go out there and make yes. marketing happen. Amen. You are preaching my language. Quickly, Jared, Jared said that he loves your names too. So oh, you're right on. No, thank you. No, I... I'm a little bit biased, a lot biased, but I think I think it's a good fit for the mission. Uh, just a, uh, real quick on that sales and marketing thing, because it definitely applies to the podcast, because your podcast could very easily be a part of your marketing plan, uh, depending on what your business vertical is, and what you're trying to accomplish. When you do a good job marketing, when you do a good job presenting your identity to your audience, to your, your stakeholder, the sales process is the natural conclusion of good marketing. When someone listens to your podcast and you've got a guest on that's relevant to the audience and you have some sort of call to action at the end of the of that episode, the, the right person is automatically going to be drawn to you because of the marketing that you did. It's almost like ninja style because when you're the host of a podcast, you can use this as a prospecting tool. And if let's say you're 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 doing a hyper local podcast or you're doing something in, in your industry that's locally focused and you want to penetrate a certain market. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself with the audience question, uh, but hey, we'll jump ahead because that's what we're doing, right? But you can use your guest almost like a Trojan horse to get access to that business vertical. Because if you pick someone in that vertical who's well-known, well-liked, well-respected, who has a great reputation, and you spend 20 or 30 minutes interviewing that person about their business, you ask insightful questions that demonstrate that you understand the industry that that person is in. When you get done with that interview, 
let's say, for instance, in, in my world, risk and commercial insurance, it's not going to be hard at all for someone who's in that vertical, who knows so-and-so, who thinks that they're great and, and wants to be more like so-and-so. When they hear a great interview from me, from someone in their vertical, do you think they might be more likely to see me as a credible thought leader and an expert in matters of risk and insurance? Do you think the person listening to that episode might be more likely to call risk well and say, hey, I saw your episode with so-and-so. Hey, I have some questions about insurance. Can you help me out? Nowhere in my episode did I promote my insurance practice. All I did was have a guest on, ask relevant questions, present myself as someone who understands that industry, and the rest of it just happens by nature. Because we as humans, we assign trust by referral so much more readily than we build trust naturally. Because if, if we have trust with party A, and party A endorses party B, well, then party B automatically inherits a high level of trust if we really had good trust with party A. That transference of trust can be a really powerful tool if you're trying to use a podcast to grow your business. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, having that um, understanding, and I've worked with clients for a very long time on podcasts, and um, some have gotten it completely and others struggled really it was, it was a challenge kind of pulling them out of that sales mentality where they feel like every single thing that they do has to be transactional and marketing should not be transactional. Sales should be transactional, but your marketing should be something that has some sort of entertainment value, a little bit of educational value, and is interesting to your audience. They don't want to be sold to. <laughs> That's not what anybody wants now. So I think, yeah. you know, um, the whole concept of having conversations with people and making it about them, not about you, is key. Yeah, it absolutely so, is. Agree. You know, if, if you're getting something off the ground if you're trying to put together the pieces you out there in listener land you know consuming this webinar right now one of the things that i feel like is so important early on the earlier on you do this the easier it's going to be for you big picture just ask yourself who's my audience who is going to listen to this thing what do i want to build that attracts a certain profile of audience because whether it's a youtube channel or some other medium of content, or it's a podcast, and in this case for our conversation today, who's the audience? What do they care about? Why are they picking your podcast? Because, and this is one of the things I say uh, from time to time when I'm uh, doing a keynote presentation uh, at a conference or whatever, in order to be good or great at anything, you first have to be okay with not being great at everything else. Because... Yeah. If someone's listening to your podcast, what are they doing? Not listening to every other podcast. Let that sink in for a second. In order for you to have success as a podcaster, you have to create content that is interesting enough to make someone click to listen to your podcast. You never know which one's going to be their first episode. And the hard part about having a back catalog is you never know which one is the first one that they get to. So you can't phone it in ever because in podcasting world if someone has a bad episode and that happens to be their first episode they ever hear of your podcast there probably won't be a second episode so yeah. you can't have a bad episode you got to be ready to play every single time you hit record because like like someone who's on broadway like a star who gets paid very well for their job on broadway you never know who's in the audience that night for the very first time and maybe the only time. So if you as the star, if you as the host have an off night, you have an off episode, you never know who's listening for the first time and won't come back. Yeah. So but we also don't want to scare people off completely from having podcasts because oh no, here's the thing. When you start, you're never going to be perfect. <laughs> It's never going to be good. That's no, the beauty of post editing. I don't, I don't do live podcasts for that very reason. I have a scratchy voice. It doesn't always work. Sometimes if it's not working, I go, okay, that one really was terrible. I might need to re-record parts of yeah. it. Or I might say something that I really hated what I said, or, you know, I was just winging it and I just sounded like an idiot. The beauty is you can take those 
parts out as long as it makes sense. Yeah. Um, also, what is your feeling? I'm just interested to know this. What's your feeling on niching down? In my personal podcast, it was very specific and I niched in because it was something that was important to me and I can do whatever I want, right? Because it's my podcast. But for corporate and um, client podcasts, I do it a little bit differently. I'm not so um, honed in. I like to have at least some variety because I think about what am I going to talk about when I'm on episode 100, like you are. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you made that decision and where you go with your your different topics. It's a great question. And I, I will answer exactly that question. Um, first, I wanted to clarify one thing, because uh, you're right, we don't want to scare people away. I said what I said about you can't ever have a terrible episode because I don't want anyone to start a podcast because it sounds like fun and they think it'll be cool. It's like if you're not approaching it with a certain level of intentionality and you're not thinking and we'll, we'll get near the end of this episode of this webinar, we'll talk about some best practices for protecting your sanity. And one of them is building a content calendar and thinking weeks and months in advance and crafting a narrative for your podcast. It's work, folks. It's if yes. you want to be good, it's work. I don't mean to scare anybody away. For God's sake, you listen to the first 20 episodes of my podcast and listen to me now. It's obvious I've learned a thing or two. Let's be real. You go back and listen to episode three or episode seven or whatever. It is a very different podcast than it is now. I promise you. Um, so to your question, Stacy, the the answer really depends. The answer to do you niche down or do you stay generalist? It comes back to what is your goal for the podcast? What do you want it to be? Are you trying to blow this thing up, get a ton of downloads, get some sponsors, make a lot of money and become micro famous in a certain pool of people? Um, I got news for you. You're never going to be Joe Rogan. Sorry. There's really only one Joe Rogan. He has literally tens of millions of monthly downloads. You're not going to be him. I'm not going to be him. Stacy's not going to be him. And we're fine with that. But to answer Stacy's question here, you have to answer what do you want it to be? What are the KPIs, the key performance indicators that you are going to use to decide if it's effective or not? If you're trying to build a business vertical, a marketing play for a particular business vertical, the niching down, I think, is amazing. You got to be okay with it, though, because the more niched you get, the smaller your population of listeners, the more, uh, the fewer downloads you're going to get, but the more involved, the more engaged your listening audience is probably going to be the more impact you'll have with a more niched down audience now the flip side of that is if you're staying more generalized and you're using a podcast for branding uh, positioning in the marketplace general awareness of what your what your company is up to and the stakeholders the channel partners the kind of folks that you have in your ecosystem having people on in as a, a guest that are adjacent to your business uh, where you want to attract a, a pretty broad audience, in that case, maybe don't niche down quite as much. But then you have a much broader competition from other podcasts. The more niche down you get, the less competition you have, but also the smaller your potential audience. So it all comes back to the goals, honestly, I think. What do you want to accomplish? What is your why, as Simon Sinek would say? Yeah, love it. Okay, so... um. Let's get into some of the best practices. Um, you and I have had years at this. You know, I, I think my first podcast that I produced was probably, gosh, now five, six years ago. And, um, and although I didn't host all of them back then, um, you know, I was the one picking the guests, coming up with the topics, coming up with the, you know, everything, doing all the marketing for it. So there's a lot involved in pre-planning a podcast. Let's go into some of that um, for the content creation leading up to a podcast, what all is involved so that people kind of understand what you're taking on. And, and to preface that, you don't have to be the one doing all this. There are people out there. I'm not plugging myself. I do it. There are tons of others that you can hire. You can um, have someone in your agency or your um, business to do it for you. It doesn't have to all be you. You could just be the one on the mic and let everybody else kind of handle the other stuff. But let's start from the very basics. What sure. is involved? 
Well, and first off, I say you should definitely promote yourself because this is your show and it's totally fine to promote yourself. Uh, if this is what you do, then girl, you promote away. I'm all for it. Let's go. The, the answer to your question, it really comes down to preparation. It's just like an athlete gets ready for the season. It's the preseason of, of athletic competition. What are they doing? They're having two a days before they even start training camp. They're coming in. They're, they're watching film from last year. They're studying a playbook. They're figuring out who's going to do what and where the, you know, where the seats on the bus are and, and who's filling what seat and what the roles are and what do we want this thing to look like. For your podcast, and I recognize that this is a high bar, and I think it is something that you don't necessarily need to do all of, but if you do most of it, you're going to be way better off than most people because most podcasts that never make it to 20 episodes, most podcasts very quietly fade away and just fizzle uh, because the people starting them don't do nearly enough preparation. I'm a big believer of having your first 50 episodes mapped out to some extent before you ever record episode one and have an idea of what are you going to talk about in episode 27 build a guest list before you even start recording anything of who am i going to have on this podcast who would i want to have hey wouldn't it be great if so and so came on and dream if you want to i mean on my podcast i have carrier ceos and big name people that had no reason to be on my pod before I started doing it. Did I, did I get them episode four? No. But before episode 30, I had a carrier CEO on my podcast. How did it happen? Because I called their VP of communications and said, hey, I've got a great podcast. I think so. Um, in this case, it was um, um, Ty Harris, CEO of Openly Insurance, uh, which is an insurance carrier in, in our industry. I reached out to some people at Openly and said, hey, I'd love to have Ty on to talk about openly and the mission of what he's doing. And on the episode, he and I talked about leadership. We talked about, you know, growing and scaling and leading and recruiting for and training and onboarding for a high performance team. Did we talk about their carrier? Yeah, we did. We also talked about some things that were very interesting for Ty as an individual. And I had the idea several weeks in advance. I'd love to have Ty Harris on. I don't know if he'll say yes, but I'm going to try. There's nothing wrong with putting a crazy guest on your list. The uh, I'm starting a, a local podcast that is going to be completely different from the industry one. And I reached out to some, some people at the city and said, hey, I'd love to have the mayor on. We're starting a new podcast. It's going to be McKinney centric. You know, Do you think the mayor would like to come on and be interviewed for our new podcast? And he said, yes. And the mayor of, of McKinney, which is 220,000 people, it's a fairly good sized city. Um, the mayor is going to be episode one's guest how did that happen we planned it we put it on paper we said when you ask that's the thing just ask. ask yeah and and earned media is huge these days people love to to be out and in front of people and any audience yeah. where they they're not having to pay to be in front of anyone they're willing to give 30 minutes to an hour of their time and they're used to having, you know, interviews and they kind of know ahead of the time, typically you'll kind of prep them on what you're going to talk about, but sometimes yep. they'll just wing it. It depends on the CEO. Um, I've, I've had several CEOs on the various different podcasts that we do. And I'll tell you every single time I've called, they say yes. And they, yeah, when can we do it? And we just have to coordinate the calendars. That's the hardest part. Yeah. But, I, but don't be afraid to ask. I love that. Yeah. The more planning that you can put in on the front end before you press the green button and start doing things, you know, answering the questions like, when are we going to record? Where are we going to record? Are we going to be on location somewhere? Are we going to set up shop at a coffee shop? Are we going to be at a restaurant and have them sponsor it? And are we going to be local? Are we going to record out in public? Are we going to record somewhere that's private? The These sort of nuts and bolts things are what make it happen because it's not you and your personality that's going to run dry it's not the desire to have a podcast that's going to run dry it's going to be your lack of planning and then you get overwhelmed with whatever your main business is and then you get behind on something and then something will happen and you'll miss an episode and once you miss that first episode it's much easier to miss a second episode if you don't get blowback and people are like hey 
where's your episode? If you miss an episode and nobody comes at you like, dude, where's your episode? I didn't see it this week or this, you know, if it's biweekly or if it's not weekly, it's very unlikely that anyone will really come at you. But if you have a regular schedule, people start to expect your episode drops, especially if you're good, especially if your audience is engaging with the content. Yeah, no, you did. No, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, Agency yeah. Freedom drops every Friday morning at 6 a.m. Central, and it's clockwork. We don't drop anything else unless it's a one-off special episode, which I'm actually dropping an episode next Tuesday, but it's an awesome. out a little bit. Yeah. Um, but to, again, not to scare people that are just starting out off, you don't have to do a weekly podcast. I don't no. do ma many weekly podcasts anymore. I did with Agency Nation and it about killed me. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's a lot of work. And because again, we haven't talked about all the other things that go along with it. You've got to create images. You've got to, you know, set everything up. You've got to have all of your assets and have them ready to go. And you have to have your clips and there's, um, there's ways to promote it. But thinking of if it's in your industry and there's not a lot of other podcasts out there and you're kind of in that, um, you know, first, and, and I will say other industries that social jazz serves like the HVAC industry and um, optometrists, they probably don't have a ton of podcasts out there like insurance does. But um, the, the key being just find what works for you. It could be once a month. And um, or biweekly, if you really want to be in front of your audience. And if you don't want to.
take chances and take risks and you know maybe something doesn't work out and then you just don't do that again you'll learn and you'll make mistakes and it's okay Yeah. And um, let's talk just quickly in the last few minutes, equipment and that sort of thing. Obviously, you and I are even on different ends of the spectrum here. I, I record most of my podcasts just for simplicity purposes, because I work from my home office in um, Georgia. I, rec I record most of them via Zoom. I've tried other platforms before Riverside FM. I've tried a couple of other ones. I just found that Zoom gave me the most... Um, flexibility and the and it allows me to kind of dual have dual purposes. I'm creating a video at the same time as I'm creating the podcast because you can split the audio and the video separately. Yep. It automatically downs it downloads those files for you. Um, talk about some of the other technology that you've used just so that people can kind of see where to start with that. Sure. One of the early decisions you're going to have to make is are you going to record video or not? Uh, if you're going to record video, then things get a lot more complicated. I would recommend you start with audio only and then move into video as you feel more comfortable with the rest of the duties and responsibilities of being a podcast host and all of the stuff that goes into what we've talked about in this episode. When you decide to go the video route, uh, you have to figure out, well, three main things. The audio that goes into the video, the video itself. Uh, the lighting, four things, the lighting, and then the the scene. Where are you physically? What's behind you? What's the look and feel? Um, I've put a lot of thought. That I have LED lights on the wall back there. I have put thought into what is hanging on the wall and the way that my office is laid out. I've got a, for those of you that are just listening that aren't watching this, uh, there's a, a custom LED kind of neon looking sign that's hanging on the wall for my agency. But more importantly, I have a, an Octabox sitting on top of a video light that's right in front of me that if I were to turn it off, it would look very different in here. And yes. it doesn't it doesn't look nearly as good without the light on. But I also have a really good microphone. And you don't have to have great microphone. You, you can you yeah. can have something as simple as the Blue Yeti, which is like $120 on Amazon. I've recorded on that for my YouTube content for two years before I ever got serious and got professional level stuff. Now to the, to the ear who knows what stuff sounds like, there's a very big difference between an entry level consumer grade microphone, which you'll probably start on. I did. I imagine Stacy probably did. Most people do at a certain point. You ask yourself, am I all in on this? Am I doing this for real? Am I, am I going to be very serious in how I approach my gear? And then you'll drop a couple thousand dollars on, on gear. But that's down the line. You don't have to do that up front. Most people don't know the difference. Maybe 5 or 10% of your audience will really know and appreciate the difference. Uh, but that's something that you can do later on down the road. Blue Yeti is a great place to start. Um, there's audio interface things. that are at Zoom H6 is what I have right now for my offsite recording. Uh, for here on my desk, I have a Rodecaster Pro uh, that everything plugs into using you know XLR cables and professional stuff. You can plug directly into your computer or your laptop and go out to a coffee shop or whatever using a USB plug-in mic, and you're fine. Put some Apple AirPods in so you can monitor yourself. You're good to go. You can get yeah. as, and I'm just warning you because I know we're short on time here, folks. You can go down the rabbit hole real quick. You really can. And you can spend a lot of money and waste a lot of money if you don't yeah. really understand what you're buying. I would encourage you if you want to go to some of the higher level equipment that you get a consultant to come in who knows their stuff because yeah. it is confusing. If you know, yeah. if you've never played with it before, I have gradually upgraded systems as I went along. I still don't have the level systems that you do um, simply because I just, if for my purposes, I didn't find, I didn't feel like yeah. it was necessary. I probably you know, will continue to add on equipment as I go. Um, but like you said, you can spend as much as you want or as little. Yep. Quickly, I, I'm going to switch gears just for a second because I noticed a question we have is if there's time, I'm curious um, how much of your content is geared towards clients or prospects versus peers, other IAs. You want to answer that? Yeah, Jared, this is an amazing question and it really speaks to audience. Um, this is something uh, that I put a lot of thought into, and I didn't do it right for a long time. 
Um, I didn't have a separate YouTube channel uh, for my peers. And I muddied the water and messed up my algorithm and a whole it caused a lot of problems because I wasn't specific with my audience. Clients and prospects are going to have one set of content and one thought and, and a whole bunch of stuff goes into clients and prospects. Like this afternoon, as soon as I finish this, I'm going to walk over there to my studio next door and I'm going to record a YouTube video. And it's simply five questions to ask someone when you're shopping for a new insurance agent. And it's 100% geared towards clients and prospects. Now, it's marketing for risk. Well, do I have other insurance agents that follow risk? Well, because they like my ideas and they take what they like and do their own version of it for their agencies. Absolutely. Does that bother me? Am I worried that someone's going to steal my good ideas? No, because implementation is very poor. I could tell you exactly what we do and exactly how we do it. And 97% of my audience would go, oh, man, that's really cool. Yeah, I should really do that. And they will never do anything with what I told them. But to answer your question, I have two completely different channels. You go to James Jenkins' YouTube channel. It is for my peers and, and other people that may want to book me for an event or hire me for consulting or whatever. That YouTube channel is totally designed for industry stuff. If a client or prospect found their way over there, it's completely by accident. Um, but the risk well channel is 100% designed for content that an insured a buyer of an insurance policy or someone who would hire us for risk management stuff would would be consuming. There's some bleed over for my peers who want to see the stuff that we're doing that's client facing because they find it interesting and it gives them good ideas to work from. But I do the same thing. I follow so many industry people, so many. It's just, I like that. Oh, I, I'm going to do something like that for my office. Well, and here's the thing that I love. Since I started podcasting, and when I started, I knew nothing. I mean, nothing. There are so many great people. Jason Cass is one of them. I could go through a huge list. Ryan Hanley's one of them. Yep. Um, you know, now you. I, if I have questions on equipment, Sydney Rowe was a, another one that I always relied on at the very beginning. Is if you have questions, just ask people. They are so willing to help. Um, you know, people will tell me about equipment. People will tell me, "Oh, I tried that. Didn't really like it. I think you should try this new whatever it is." And ninety times, nine times out of ten, I had not heard of it previously they'll just throw out something and I'll be feverishly writing oh that's cool didn't even know existed because you have to really take the time to research to know everything that's out there and it's a lot of trial and error and a lot of them have been there done that so rely on other people that you know that have had successful podcasts or have done it before and just pick their brain buy them a cup of coffee or send them something you know in exchange for their time and effort I'm sure that they would be willing to share. I know, you know, being a mentor is important to me, I know. Um, and I know it is for others. Anything, um, we're getting down to the end. I could talk on this subject for a very long time. Yep. Obviously, I love it. Um, yeah. So um, if people want to hit you up later, how do they get in touch with you, James? For something on this subject, uh, probably the easiest thing is to just go to james at jamesjenkins.com. Uh, if you are talking about any of this sort of stuff that's not specifically insurance related, uh, my I have like seven email addresses. It's a little bit frustrating sometimes. I don't know why I did that. Um, they're for very specific things. Um, but I, I'll sometimes put the like, link. In the show notes too. Yeah, we'll sometimes make sure I have to think have about which email address is most appropriate for this given audience. So, uh, yeah, just hit me up at James at jamesjenkins.com and I'll be happy to help with any sort of questions or, you know, gear or, hey, how do I X, whatever. Most of what I do, folks, is just hop on YouTube and ask questions of the search bar and then get lost in the rabbit hole of YouTube videos. Yeah. But, um, you know, to close, I just, I really want to, talk about the people who are brand new. Again, I always kind of go back to them. Yep. Um, don't be afraid to start. Uh, everybody has a voice. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be polished and professional and everything. I mean, you know, to an extent, don't say anything that you don't want others to hear. And if you do make sure that you delete that out before it goes out, you need to be, um, 
aware that there are people outside of your normal audience that may hear it, especially once it hits Apple or Spotify, it gets amplified. And as James mentioned before, your organic reach continues to grow episode after episode as longer, the longer that those episodes are online, the longer exposure it has and the more reach it has. So you're going to grow those numbers just by having these things out there and having the, the continual you know, new content coming in all the time will help in all other areas of marketing. And unlike James does, you can use it to promote um, various different things and you can put it out on your social channels and you can really push it as part of you know who you are. Become the expert on your subject matter. Become the guy that you know people kind of lean in on and to learn new things. And it doesn't you know have to be rocket science. You can just kind of figure it out as it as you go. But I encourage you all um, to do it. Just, you know, what does Nike say? Just do it, right? Just do it. Just do it. So I want to thank you, James, for everything that you shared with us today. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. I love your voice. You have a voice for podcasting. I, on the other hand, do not. I just embrace what I got. Hey, you know, let's go. <laughs> you do you, lady. I, I appreciate the kind <laughs> words. Thank you for the invite today. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, and for all of you that are watching or listening later on, um, yeah, I know I speak for Stacy when I say this, but we're, we're here to help. Uh, we're, you know, I'm an open book. Um, if there's anything that I can do to expand on what we've talked about here today, uh, and Stacy King does this professionally. This is what she does, folks. She is, uh, she is a thought leader and a consultant and an advisor. Um, so if, if it's anything on Stacy's side of things and social jazz and the other things that she's involved in, uh, I know she's eager to talk with you as well. I will answer the question if I can, and I will kick you to Stacy if I can't. Perfect. That's a perfect way to answer that. Um, of course, if you do need any help managing, you know, your social media accounts for your business or have questions about the social jazz platform, who is bringing this episode to um, the airwaves today, uh, you can reach them at hello at socialjazz.com. They're always available and willing to help. And again, thank you for joining us. And I hope that everyone will join us for the next one. Y'all have a great afternoon. And thanks again, James. Oh,